people who recently joined our club. Uh, Jane Altshuler is, is um, I won't say typical, she is atypical because of her in incredible background in the video and film industry and TV. Um, but we're starting to see, joining the club, many people who have, are, are new to the village but have a lot of background in video, television, and whatnot. And it's, it's amazing. We got a, a tremendous crew as a result in the studio. And uh, putting all that together, as you'll see tonight. I want to mention a couple things. Um, I hope you received a, a greeting from Don Hill, our, our new uh, greeter. He is uh, taking that on. I think he's still out there. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Well, it's easy when you have a lot of smiling faces. Okay. Well, that's important. Keep them smiling. A um, couple of upcoming events. One thing that we did recently that uh, you may not be aware of, we took a uh, copy of this uh, plaque you see on the front of the podium here and recognized our 30th anniversary by installing it in the Clubhouse One uh, pedestals. Have you ever been over there? You can see all the different clubs. We are now represented after 30 years. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy, for all your work there. Thank you, Bonnie Fulton and Leon Goldberg. Yes, Bonnie Fulton, Leon Goldberg who uh, chased down the best place to put it. And uh, we're, we're looking for uh, uh, a lot of smiling faces as you walk by and see us represented there. We have uh, ongoing classes by Tom Nash. He couldn't be here tonight. He's not feeling up to par. But um, uh, he is starting and he's continuing some classes and uh, he's going to be uh, starting one soon on lighting effects. Um, this is one of his several, that it, how to improve different aspects of your videos, and lighting is very important. And so he'll talk about how to use outdoor lighting, indoor lighting, and all of those aspects. We also have a, a repeat by Scott Marvel of his popular class, How to Make Amazing Movies with Your Smartphone. <laughs> that has uh, been one of our more popular classes. It's a four-part class, and uh, Scott has done a lot of work uh, using his smartphone. If you've seen any of the Thrive series and other videos that he does. So he'll be teaching you how to do that using your smartphone, whether you're on an Android or Apple device. And... Um, uh, we're going to see um, Stephanie uh, step up and do her latest uh, uh, class on easy movie making with Apple Clips. Clips is a new app that Apple provides. It does some interesting um, animation effects uh, with your videos, and uh, she's become an expert on that, showing other people how to do that. And uh, if you learn that, you can take care of your holiday cards and whatnot. So that's, that's also fun. So a um, lot of classes for your uh, education. And um, uh, I want to turn now to our uh, guest speaker of the evening, uh, Jane Altshuler. Uh, when I got her uh, uh, bio, and looked at all of the things that she has done. My goodness, she's been in television, film, music, and publishing uh, for years and years. And she's had her hand on some of my favorites, Masterpiece Theater, where she served as a producer, director, and story editor. And, and uh, she's produced uh, recut of over 25 British miniseries. Don't you love some of the British uh, material? Yeah. Well, she's she can tell you how, how all that went. Uh, she also served as producer director for the 
PBS series on Time Incorporated's March of Time newsreels covering the years 35 to 51, and those two are classic. Uh, she also uh, served the same role for a three-hour television history of rock and roll. Uh, it wasn't television, it was not a theatrical exhibition, but uh, I'll talk about that. Okay, good. <laughs> She'll talk about that. Uh, the, it's called The Walk Through Rock, and her editing credits also include a PBS Everly Brothers uh, rock and roll documentary and hundreds of other music videos and TV spot announcements. So let's welcome one of our new, uh, very well seasoned um, uh, members to the video club. Thank you, James. <laughs> So are we turning that off now? <laughs> uh, we're going to turn this off or down. And if, if you are Hello. Easier. One, two, three. Okay, it sounds good. Okay. All good. right. Well, Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> Appreciate your being here. Good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure to talk uh, tonight. And uh, first, I want to say I'm going to try to keep my talk to about 30 minutes. And I'm going to show a little sample reel at the end after that has the cl uh, clips of the things I'm going to be talking about so that you'll know what they are when you see them at the end rather than at the beginning. <laughs> so when I spoke with Steve and Lucy and Tom about what I should talk about tonight, um, uh, I, I said maybe, uh, I suggested it would be what was the spine of my story, which they thought was a way for me to bring in elements of my career and also provide all of you with some useful information about your own work. But as I sat down and called together key elements of my career, I really had to laugh because my career has been filled with so many twists and turns um, there's not one spine, but I could speak quite a bit about many projects. And it became obvious that in my career, I'm the spine of the story. <laughs> so uh, that said, in any project, finding the spine of the story means identifying the primary point of the story and then deciding what is the critically important information needed to communicate the point of the story to the audience. By example, Steven Spielberg's E.T., the E.T. wants to go home. But there are many complications before the kids can help their little extraterrestrial friend go home. Or again with Spielberg's Jaws, based on Peter Benchley's book, the spine of the story is Great White Shark Terrorizes Long Island ta uh, Town. And I don't know about you, but I was terrorized by Jaws. And as the director Sidney Pollack often said, the spine is the armature, like in uh, sculpting. It's the armature of the work to which every other element is keyed. So Tootsie's spine is male actor can't get work as a man, so he pretends to be a woman to get work. Everything in Tootsie is about the complications due to this one key element. So it seems simple, but learning how to identify the spine and creatively build upon it to realize your work is challenging. It's a craft that takes time to master and learn. And please trust that it took me many teachers, friends, and mentors for me to become an editor, producer, and director. My parents in Philadelphia were my first mentors. My dear dad, Milton Brodsky, was an organizational manager professionally who I knew had to have a project ready on time and in budget. I grew up with that. His wise counsel remains with me always, especially his often repeated adage, and maybe you all heard this when you were young too, remember Jane, if you're going to do a job, do it thoroughly, 
the very best that you can. And my late mo mother, Betty Brodsky, who Betsy Martin knew quite well when she lived here, and maybe some of you knew my mother, Betty Brodsky, uh, is the reason my husband and I ended up living here. She was a great role model. She was a pioneer theater producer in, in the 1950s who co-founded the respective Philadelphia Drama Guild and Pie Piper Productions, which was a children's theater company, and she later became a very accomplished advertising executive. Lucky little me. <laughs> I thought all moms were producers. I often accompanied her to production meetings and rehearsals, witnessing many times over the process of getting to opening night. I call it apprenticing by witnessing. Eyes and ears open, mouth shut. <laughs> And by the time I was 10 or 11, I often ushered during the run of a play, seeing classics by Sophocles, Aristophanes, Moliere, Shaw, Shakespeare, Sean O'Casey, Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller, among many others, every night of the run, which was usually about two weeks, which contributed to my understanding of story structure long before I was thinking about my career or how to find the spine. Of note, however, during the 1961-62 season, the Drama Guild presented the premiere of Jules Pfeiffer's Crawling Arnold. This was about a man who was an accountant, but his mother was the, uh, the, uh, uh, in charge of the uh, nuclear, uh, did, you know, where to hide when you were having a uh, nuclear attack. And when he got home, he would get down on his knees and crawl because his mom was the captain and he had to go back to being a little boy. But that's Jules Pfeiffer. Anyway, I will never forget seating Jules Pfeiffer and, and his friend Mike Nichols. <laughs> Later, I will elaborate on how they both eventually played a part in my career. The lesson being the spine of anyone's career can have many brief encounters with talented people that enriches the whole of one's journey. So where did the idea of finding the spine of the story come from? How many of you have heard of the group theater? Okay, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about them. <laughs> you may know more about them than you think you do. <laughs> My mom planted in me her passion for the group theater when I was very young. The group theater, for those of you who do not know about this seminal artistic band of artistic, uh, of directors, writers, and actors, was founded in 1930 by Harold Clerman. Stella Adler, Ilya Kazan, who directed uh, many films I'm sure you saw, Lee Strasberg, who started Actor Studio, Clifford Odets, Cheryl Crawford, and the great teacher Sanford Meisner, and others. They embraced the mes methods of Konstantin Stanislavski. Who heard of him? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. Uh, of the Moscow Art Theater. My mother's favorite member was Harold Clerman, who was both a theater director and a theater critic. She quoted him all the time, to me, at parties, to her theater friends. I took note. <laughs> the first play Harold Clerman directed was Awake and Sing by Clifford Odets in 1935. The play's success led Clerman to developing his directing style. He had learned from Stanislavski's teachings that all the elements of a play, text, acting, lighting, scenery, and direction, needed to work together to convey a unified message. He would read the script over and over and over again, each time focusing on a different character. 
using the technique to identify the main action of the play and the behavior of each character and from that determine the spine of the story. Clerman went on to direct many Tony award-winning plays. So the idea of finding the spine of the story came from the members of the group theater in this country who basically learned it from Stanis uh, Stanislavski. An actor prepares the first of uh, Stanislavski's books on acting was the group theater's Bible, if you will. And I happen to bring my copy <laughs> of The Fervent Years by Harold Clerman, the group theater, and the 30s. So if you don't, you know, you can probably Google this book and get a copy for a dollar or two on Amazon or something like that if you're interested. So with this childhood uh, and acting in high school, when it came time to go to college, I contemplated majoring in theater, but decided instead to study uh, TV, film, and journalism at Temple University School of Communications in Philadelphia. And while I was there, I further decided I wanted to go into news and public affairs and make documentaries. In my senior year, I married Richard Altschiller in June of 1968. Say hello to Richard. <laughs> so we had our 50th last June. <laughs> He was studying for his PhD in sociology at New York University when we moved to Greenwich Village in New York in August of 68. I still needed three credits to graduate from Temple and my senior project that fall was reviewing the 1968 New York Film Festival. I got a press pass and off I went to Lincoln Center every day. So the young directors like Bernardo Bertolucci, Werner Herzog, Jean-Luc Godard, John Cassavetes, and Milos Forman prem uh, premiered films uh, that year, and that was quite a bunch, and took questions after the press screenings. This was such a turning point for me. I was suddenly immersed in the new wave directors who embraced truthful, naturalistic filmmaking, not very different than the group theater, and from then on I wanted to be a director. Ha ha, catch 22. <laughs> there were very few women directors then, which is pretty much true to this day. Uh, but even though the great Agnes Varda just died, but that didn't bother me. So upon graduating from Temple, my first job was at Gray Advertising in New York in the production and traffic department. My responsibilities included going to the film lab with the editors to approve the color corrected 35 millimeter and 16 millimeter check prints, and then ordering hundreds of prints to distribute to the net networks and local TV stations according to the media buys. I loved it and made friends with the guys at the lab, no women, of course, who taught me about different film stocks, the developing and printing of dailies or rushes, and, uh, and making of inner negatives. And with two of the top TV spot editors in New York, Frank Minerva and Bob Lynch. And over time, I kind of let it know that I eventually wanted to direct. To my surprise, uh, let's see, <laughs> whoops, well let's see what happened, anyway I left advertising to get a master's degree in educational communications to kind of wanted to play it safe there just to be sure after all it was you know, the early 70s, and uh, I thought I better have a safety net. But anyway, to my surprise, my master's degree, Bob and Frank asked me if I wanted to be an apprentice editor. Wow. <laughs> but I wasn't sure, I still wasn't sure that that was the right career choice for me uh, until I ran into my friend Peter Salem 
in Washington Square Park, near where we lived, where he was the assistant cameraman for the director of phot uh, photography, the great Arthur Ornitz, on Sidney Lumet's Serpico with Al Pacino. Peter, knowing I wanted to direct, immediately said, Jane, you have to take it. Learning editing is the best path to becoming a director. I have often told this story and will never forget that day. Of course, watching Sidney Lumet, one of my favorite directors, direct Al Pacino that day was pretty cool too, made it pretty memorable. Both were members of the actor's studio, Lee Strasberg's actor's studio, and followers of the method. In fact, Lumet famously required several weeks of rehearsals with the actors to identify their motivation before day one of shooting. Today, with busy schedules, most features, most big features, have no rehearsal time at all. They cast for an actor whose persona and experience fits the part perfectly. So how many of you saw Serpico? How many have Pacino's performance emblazoned in your memory? <laughs> if you saw it, do you remember the spine of the story? What was it? Anybody? OK. Lamette described Frank Serpico as a real-life detective in a bramble of co uh, corrupt cops who became a whistleblower. He called him a rebel with a cause. So I am honored that in 1973, in a field where there were few women editors, that I learned my craft from these two export, expert mentors, Frank and Bob, who knew I had the passion to do the work. They signed my application and paid for my initiation into the Film Editors Union, which was mandatory to work on any union film. I will forever cherish the beautiful craft of motion picture film editing and becoming a master of it during the last 15 or 20 years before the digital revolution around 1990. Sadly, in this digital age, a young filmmaker can no longer get an editing assistantship working on 35 millimeter. So after three years, Bob and Frank decided I was ready to cut spots and let me work with their, their clients who knew and trusted me. The important skill in editing picture is training your eye to find the best performance of what was scripted, where there were routinely 20 takes for each setup. Then, for TV spots, which were little movies, how to tell the story in 60 or 30 seconds. Please envision that at times there were 10 creative people uh, crowding around the moviola. And mind you, a moviola picture, I still have my moviola, but the picture head was a little teeny picture head, <laughs> about the size of an iPad, a, little, a big iPad. Uh, and, you know, they, won they were so nervous that their concept worked, that, you know, the art director, the copywriters, the creative director. So uh, with that pressure, the editor had to find the spine of that story that they had back, all banked on to get this uh, spot approved. And once it was approved by the client in New York, the assistant pulled and spliced the selected negative prepared materials for the optical house where the optical negative would be shot, split the tracks, alternating the sing sound tracks, and laid in the music tracks for the editor to take to the mixing studio. This amount of expertise was not required in the Hollywood system where there was a different department for each task. So again, I was fortunate that I knew the whole process which served me well later in my career. And after completing a few hundred jobs, you get good at it. <laughs> then I got an offer I couldn't refuse <laughs> to be the editor of an independent feature film 
called Getting Together, which was a comedy about group marriage written and directed by a Canadian man who had won the director's fortnight at the Cannes Film Festival uh, with his first film, Winter Kept Us Warm. Now this, I have to tell you, was quite a saga. You can ask Richard. Almost everyone, except for me and Richard, lived and worked at the 14th Street and 2nd Avenue Brownstone on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in what was considered a film commune. But you have to remember, there was no independent film scene hardly at all at that time. Claudia Weil was making Girlfriends, and you know Ar Arnold was making Pumping Iron, and pretty much that was it. You know, there was not. Today, it's a huge, huge, huge thing, but then there was almost none. So the company was so unique that it was featured on like WNEW local news, and we'd get written up in the newspaper with pictures. So I was in heaven at first. I thought I'd have the film edited in four to five months, but without the money that advertising jobs uh, spend, it took 18 months with many, many unbelievable happenings along the way that would take like three hours to tell about. So uh, the film premiered at the Virgin Island Film Festival and later that was known as the Houston Film, film Festival and it was released in New York where it ran for several months. The best part was that my editing work on the film, like even the United Artists executives said, oh, the best part of this film is the editing, you know, but there was a lot of other egos there, so you have to learn not to be, get too bent out of shape. But anyway, uh, it was respected, and people I knew knew that I was looking for new work. They introduced me to this fella, and it led to me becoming partners with a man named Steve, who had switched from film editing to offline tape editing on an analog computerized editing machine called the CMX50. There was only two or three of them in all of New York City at the time, which he was sharing the one he used with Editel New York, which was a division of EUE Screen Gems. This was 13 years before Avid and then Final Cut Pro took over post-production. But it was a moment too soon for a company to offer only offline tape editing. Not enough business. You know, a lot of the big advertisers, they weren't into tape yet. So in early 1977, we opened Edit Tape, Edit Film Inc. at 42nd Street and 3rd Avenue. And at age 30, I was one of the few women to own such a company in New York or anywhere <laughs> and got my full editor's card because I was an owner member and I was the president of the company as well. So the man who backed us, his name was Bob Winkler. He owned Winkler Video, which provided production and post-production services to a lot of big companies. He introduced me, us, to uh, Mobile Oil Public Affairs team led by a man named, named Herb Schmertz. And their offices, the mobile offices at that time, were on 42nd Street, right across the street from the studio, our studio. Herb Schmertz was the visionary that associated Mobile Oil with WGBH from Boston's Masterpiece Theater in the early 1970s and also created the Mobile Showcase Network, a, which was a first-run syndication network, meaning it wasn't a regular network, but they created their own network and syndicated the shows. They, they happened to have the Thursday night time slot. And he did this with a man named Stan Moger of SFM Media. And, Stan and I were <laughs> friends for many years, for, and uh, by association, my association with Mobile lasted from 1977 to 1992. And throughout, I worked with Paul Gerken, manager of broadcast TV for her. As I was the president of the company, I became Mobile's 
token woman president, supplier, to fulfill their affirmative action requirements that had been voted in. And again, lucky me. <laughs> Over those years, I produced and directed the opening and closing billboards, as Steve said, for over 25 British shows, often working with the very best New York graphic designers. And I just wonder if any of you have ever heard of Ivan Tremayov or Seymour Quast or R.O. Blackman or Paul Davis or Richard Greenberg. I mean, Richard Greenberg designed the opening title for the movie Alien, for example. And if you've seen the Nine West, the Nine and on 57th Street, Ivan designed that Nine that everybody sees in New York. So uh, they were really, all, they're all in the Art Directors Hall of Fame and working with them was fantastic. And many of these shows went on and won international Emmys, and we always went, you know, Mobile always had the whole team come. We went to the international Emmys. It was fun. And since the BBC, for example, had no responsibility to make a show any specific length or time or end on the hour or the half hour, it was my job to cut out anywhere from four to 45 minutes to conform to the Masterpiece Theater or mobile showcase network time spots. So for example, how do you cut out 45 minutes from Shakespeare's King Lear starring Sir Lawrence Olivier? Hi. Trust me, you have to identify the spine of the story. So King Lear depicts the king's slow descent into madness after he disposes of his kingdom by giving bequeaths to two of his three daughters who continually and falsely flatter him, bringing tragic, tragic consequences. Here, as with many other Shake of Shakespeare's plays, he included scenes to add folly or to develop a backstory, but that was not really needed to keep continuity. I mean, you know back there at the Globe Theater, people bought their lunch, their dinner, they stayed, they didn't care how long it was, and Shakespeare accommodated that. Well, as a rule, of course, the BBC would include every word of a play. I was good at identifying and cutting out these scenes. Or when Herb Schmertz wanted to release Evel Evelyn Wall's scoop about a man named Boot. Uh, <laughs> as a feature film, I went to London to look at all of the outtakes so I could make it work as a two-hour film, which I did. And eventually, it was released to Masterpiece Theater instead of as a theatrical feature. And it got excellent reviews for the editor. Of course, the e English era uh, editor, Derek Bain, got all the credit for that. And you'll see uh, a little bit of scoop on my reel at the end. So not also not long after opening Edit Tape Edit Film in 1977, Editel, who we were sharing the machine with, booked a three-month job on the CMX 50 at night. I, re I returned to the studio late one afternoon to find a man taking a carton of milk out of the refrigerator, who asked me if it was fresh, assuming I was the assistant or the secretary. I said, I have no idea. I put up my hand saying, hi, I'm Jane Altschiller, president of Edite Betafilm. And he shook my hand saying, hi, I'm Lauren Michaels. Do you know who Lauren Michaels is? <laughs> I had no idea who he was. <laughs> I was busy with finishing the feature the previous year and never watched the first year of Saturday Night Live. <laughs> of which, for those of you who don't know, Lauren was the founder and is still the producer to this day. What a wonderful surprise. So for the next three months, my good friend Randy Cohen from Editel was cutting the NBC's Paul Simon special from 5 p.m. on every single night. As I often work late with my clients, the, the, the agency producers used to come at 5 or 5.30. Yeah, I'd have wine and drinks, and we would work as late as they felt like. Some of them liked to stay forever. 
And nevertheless, I became friendly with Paul, Lauren, and the whole creative team. Richard and I were invited to Saturday Night Live on many occasions. And later, when Randy Cohen became partners with Lauren at his a company, Broadway Video, which was the same kind of company as Editel, they had online one-inch post-production with all the Grass Valley switchers and everything that you can imagine. That's where you finish the jobs. Randy asked me to be the tape-to-film release editor for Lauren's production of one of the Saturday Night Live writer, Michael O'Donohue's film, Mr. Mike's Mondo Video which my friend Bob Shea at New Line Cinema was releasing as a feature when NBC refused to air it on network TV. Michael was a pretty far out fellow. Anyway, uh, all it's, uh, and doing a tape to film transfer and getting prints in the lab, that, there was a few people that did that and I worked with them. So all fortuitous meetings for the spine of my story and years later, when I eventually did close my company to the, due to the complete takeover of digital and started to write screenplays, the production executives at Broadway Video Features at Paramount Pictures always would read my screenplays and I could go over there and hang out if I wanted to because I got to know them. Um, in fact, being the president of Edit Tape, Edit Film, and later Jane Altschiller Productions, provided me with a home base for my various projects and allowed me to develop relationships with many other wonderful colleagues in New York, London, and Los Angeles. And I always had that desire to direct in the back of my mind. And I, that, those were good connections to have. So while the company was still Edit Tape, Edit Film, I was among the founding members of New York Women in Film and Television, which was also an important support system for my career. And I was also the founder, me and 30 other men, of the Association of Independent Commercial Editors, uh, which was people that had the same kind of shop I had. And, you know, that, the proof is in the pudding at the first meeting. There was me and a huge conference table of the others, you know. So, and me and my partner. Anyway, in 1980, a colleague of mine introduced me to a man, Bob Feldman, who had been in the Peace Corps in Nigeria during the Biafran War. He was then the director of foreign trade for the state of Alabama. Now, Nigeria had just written a constitu uh, constitution based on the U.S. Constitution and elected their first president, Shehu Shigari. And Bob passionately wanted to make a documentary to introduce Nigeria, a fledgling democracy, to the United States. The spine of the story was Nigeria, the unknown giant. The U.S. also, the U.S. had an $11 billion trade deficit with Nigeria due to oil. But new democracy or not, U.S. business people were afraid to go there. So skeptically, I said, great, Bob, <laughs> let's do a budget. I think you'll need $500,000 minimum. He said, okay. Let's do the budget, which we did. We wrote up the treatment with Bob and I as co-executive producers, Edit Tape, Edit Film Incorporated, as the production company, and guess what? Me as the director. So I was thrilled. With this, we gained support for the project from former Secretary of State Cyrus Vance, who had helped Nigeria uh, become a democracy during the Carter administration the U.S. Departments of Commerce and Agriculture, and then Vice President George H.W. Bush, the chair of the Joint Agricultural Consultative Committee between U.S. and Nigeria. And we did interview V.P. Bush in the executive office building as part of the film. And he knew his stuff. He didn't have to have anybody sitting there telling him what to say. I mean, he had been the UN ambassador. He, the man knew his stuff. He, he could talk about it all by himself for hours without some little person coming in and telling him what to say. 
and I was very impressed by that. Uh, <clears throat> darn if Bob, who helped to set up the uh, Yale School of Organizational Management, among other jobs he had, did raise enough from foundations like Koch and Westinghouse and in-kind services from Pan Am, like round-trip tickets, business class for the whole crew, the equipment and the film stocker. I mean, that's a lot of money right there. And he had in-country contributions that got us caravan vans, guest houses, and meals. So we went to shoot the film. Well, he, imagine me, Director Jane, <laughs> leading a crew of five men and one other woman, for she was an assistant camera woman and jack of all trades, for six weeks throughout Nigeria when U.S. businessmen were afraid to go and The Economist magazine had just said dead bodies could often lay in the streets of Lagos, the capital, for days. <laughs> Richard and my parents were anxious to say the least. But Bob Feldman was really an expert on Nigeria. And as with all good documentaries, we pre-produced the entire shoot and lined up most of the chiefs, up com uh, country business people, farmers, all kinds of interesting little village people for two weeks before my Emmy awarded DP, Bob Elstrom and his crew arrived. I learned that in a third world country, if you give folks time to prepare, they will go overboard to help you. If you don't know this, you'll, they'll just stand there and somebody will say, oh, they're so stupid. They're not stupid, they just don't have the things uh, available to them that we take for granted. And we also had the highest credentials from the Nigerian government, and they attached the leading sitcom star to our production team. His name was Joe Leote. He was beloved everywhere and welcomed, and he helped to smooth things over and open doors for us on more than one occasion. So upon returning, PBS distribution was uh, secured. However, while we were busy with post-production, there was a military coup overthrowing President Shigari. <laughs> and installed was General Mohamedou Buhari, who later actually got elected. But anyway, and this ended the new democracy. It's hard to bring democracy to a third world country. Anyway, uh, all of the government speakers were out of power. They, Things, if we know this fellow who we, uh, worked in Nigeria and he wrote a play called Things They Happen, and that's what happens there. We finished editing and screened the film both in the United States and Nigeria to all those interested in the subject of the story, but of course PBS was out. But as it happens, every bit of the spine of the story introducing Nigeria, the unknown giant, and discussing trade relations with Nigeria, because it was well research researched, is still true to this day in terms of what to expect when trading there, or for that matter, matter any third world country. You have to get to know the people and build trust. They are very tribal, and uh, especially, this is the most important, because we can all relate to it, if you put your money in, how can you be sure you're going to get your money out? So you'll see a few scenes from this in my reel. However, and this is a doozy here, however, as a result of the Nigerian film, another important event occurred in my story. One of my advertising clients, Hugh Herbert Burns, he was a kind of fun, dapper Englishman who loved Kenya. And where he had filmed many times. And uh, <clears throat> he had the first draft of the movie Out of Africa that he got from his pal and fellow Kenya aficionado, Peter Beard, who's a very well-known photographer 
and raconteur, and he's had shows in New York, and has a farm in the Dagon Hills that was right next door to Karen Blixen. So therefore, you know, he had been, uh, become a consultant to the film. So Hugh urged me to read it and then asked director Sidney Pollack if I could be his editor for Out of Africa. So if you're incredulous about this, believe me, I was too. <laughs> I said, Hugh, you're crazy. He's got his own excellent editors. But Hugh, who had seen both my feature and the Nigerian film, and of course had worked for me, uh, with me for several years, would not stop urging me and gave me Sydney's address and phone number on the Warner Brother lot in LA, Burbank really. Finally, I relented and sent Sydney a letter, my resume, a clip of the Nigerian film, some pictures, and I discussed Baroness Blixen but I did not mention that I had read the script. I didn't. <laughs> when I didn't hear back after two weeks, Hugh made me write again. To my surprise, one afternoon, my assistant said, Sidney Pollock's on the phone. I almost fell over. <laughs> Before I tell you what he said, while I was a big fan of the way they were, they shoot horses, don't they? Jeremiah Johnson, Tootsie, to name a few uh, films that he, of course, directed. I knew very, very little about him. Don't forget, there was no wiki, no Google, no nothing at that point. You had to go to the library or read fan magazines, but he wasn't the kind of person you would find in that kind of magazine. Uh, so, you know, before I wrote the letter, I found, I did some research, and I found that he had attended neighborhood playoffs to study with who? Sandy Meisner from the group theater. And then became Meisner's assistant for six years before he went to direct in Hollywood. That knowledge helped me enormously when I wrote the letter. And as I later came to know, Whenever Sidney spoke about his work, and he spoke all the time, he always credited Meisner for teaching him his craft and always said, you have to find the spine of the story. I said on the phone, so I got on the phone, I said, hello, Sidney thanked me for my letter, the pictures and the tape from the Nigerian film and my insights, but he had already selected an editor for the film and actually, he said he selected Pete Zinner, who he'd worked with, but he ended up with the Steinkemps, and the, there's a Steinkemp Senior and Steinkemp Junior, and he worked with them for many years after that. And we chatted about shooting in Africa, and he thanked me again and wished me well as I did him. Well, my friend Hugh thought this was all great and said, you'll meet him one day, and so I did. And that comes later. Now, not long after, Stan Moger from SFM, who syndicated the Mobile Showcase Network shows, asked Paul Gerken and I to create a TV pilot based on the March of Time newsreels. Time, Inc. sponsored this Academy Awarded uh, series, which was shown in movie theaters from 1935 to 1951. Please trust that screening these films was a fantastic history le lesson that, of that critical period, which was and had the most amazing gems in, in it, and it covered the Depression and FDR, the New Deal, the World War II, the war in the Pacific, domestic life in the U.S., entertainment figures, and it also featured segments on Churchill, De Gaulle, Hitler, Eisenhower, Gandhi, Albert Einstein, Oppenheimer and the atomic bomb. It was a treasure trove. And we made a great pilot, which I directed. <laughs> and as a result, Stan went on to produce a BBC series based on our work that came back to the US on PBS. But that's the way he could work the deal, and he was a, real, a deal maker. And you'll see some clips from this at the end. So at that point, my edit tape, edit film partner, Steve, left the company in 1984 after seven years together. His 
automobile clients from Detroit asked him to open his own editorial company in Bloomfield Hills outside of Detroit. And this was, they were going to back him to the hilt. And it was a great opportunity for him. He had three kids. His wife was willing to go there. So it's a very nice community. So I renamed the company Jane L. Chiller Productions and continued working with my ad agency clients and was also the editor of two documentaries produced by uh, Delilah Productions. And the, sh the owner of that was Stephanie Bennett, and she was a very successful producer. And both were directed by Richard Delighter. The first was the Everly Brothers Rock and Roll Odyssey, which was aired on PBS in 1984, which was a wonderful document on Don and Phil's uh, early lives and their mentors and career. So you can see segments of the Everly Brothers Rock and Roll Odyssey on YouTube. You just have to Google it if you'd like to see it. Uh, it's not all there, but a lot of segments are there. And immediately following was the Everly Brothers album flash with interviews and, uh, with Don and Phil and four music videos, including their hit On the Wings of a Nightingale, which is all on the Wings of a Nightingale, uh, which is also on YouTube. There's more than one version. You have to see the album flash version to see the one I did. And it was written for them by Paul McCartney. And the show aired on Cinemax. And I, uh, I really enjoyed doing those things. And a lot of people saw them. And all of a sudden, as a result, the next year, Richard and uh, Delighter and I co-produced and directed Pepsi's Walk Through Rock, a three-hour history of rock and roll with 15-minute uh, with segments, including Elvis and Rockabilly, dance, girl groups, teen idols, and surf. The Beatles, San Francisco and Psychedelia, singer, songwriter, hard rock, to name a, th a few. That was a theatrical traveling exhibition that played in big venues like the Staples Center or the Forum. And we got the job in early May and had to deliver it by September 1st for the premiere in Kansas City, which we did, and I say that with great pride. And we had a team of 11. We had two top writers from Rolling Stone magazine. We screened over 4,000 hours of clips from Ed Sullivan, Dick Clark, Hullabaloo, Scopatones from the old jukeboxes, and from features like Jailhouse Rock, where the clip, even for theatrical, the clip of Elvis cost $7,000 for 30 seconds. And at that time, we logged in all the uh, we had to log everything in on the computer, and if a clip made it into the rough cut, you know, we had to send it to the lawyer to see if he could clear it before it could end up in the final cut. So we had to have a well-oiled machine to keep things going there. And in, in the last, uh, in, by August, we needed two online post houses and two mixing studios that could deliver Dolby Stereo. And to this day, many consider it one of the best histories of rock. And that's precisely because we had clips others never even asked for because we were only clearing for theatrical. So it's a collector's item. And it's available at the Paley Library in New York. And of course, I have a copy of each segment. And you'll see a few selections in the, uh, of this in my reel. But I would like to point out one thing. This was two years. Be, uh, after MTV started. And I have to say, our, our art director was brilliant. We had a great team. And many techniques we used were innovated by us and later used by everybody else. And I also have to say that sometimes we would be running 10 one-inch machines at the same time with the Grass Valley switcher in order to get uh, blend, uh, you know, there's not 24 layers. You know, you had, to, you had to work that way at that time because there was no digital post, I mean, and no digital conform yet. So we were great. <laughs> anyway, the following May, I 
I really loved this so much. I thought, let's try to get it cleared after the next uh, five years are up. So the following May, I went to both the Montreux Music Festival and the Cannes Film Festival to line up backers. But it was just too expensive, ultimately, to clear it for home, you know, uh, home video and TV. So that wasn't to be. However, the captain of the uh, con jury that year was Sidney Pollock. <laughs> So when he appeared at the Carlton Bar in Cannes, I went to introduce myself. And from then on until he passed away too young from the big C at 73 in 2008, I treasured that he was a friend and mentor to my career. In fact, he was very generous and mentored many, many other filmmakers throughout his career. And I could always write or call with updates on projects and, de and the development execs at his company, Mirage Enterprises, read every one of my screenplays, but that's for post-1990. Anyway, I also, guess what? I also came to know Sidney's teacher, the great Sandy Meisner, and later took Meisner's class in LA when I was working on a project there. I was studying with him and his other assistant, Ron Stetson, you know, uh, acting for directors, uh, studying how to direct actors. So the two of the great teachers of finding the spine of the story became my mentors. And when you have mentors like these two, you work hard to find the pure chicken soup in a project as both San Sandy and Sydney would often say. I think maybe Sandy said it first, and Sydney started to say it. And if you want to find Meisner on acting with an introduction by Sydney Pollock, it's an interesting uh, read. <laughs> so in the spring of 1987, I, I edited the animated film called Boomtown which was produced by performing artists for nuclear disarmament. And guess who wrote that? Jules Pfeiffer. <laughs> and animated by Bill Plimpton. It premiered at the New York Film Festival, and the Cold War was still raging, as it was a year before uh, November 88, when the Berlin Wall fell. And the spine was, maybe the Russians are not coming. Anyway, Boomtown traveled the world and won many, many awards. I think a lot of people were sick of the Cold War, and this hit the right button. Anyway, during the summer of 1987, I was asked to join the production team for the Discovery Project in Los Angeles by a college friend of mine. He actually went to the University of Pennsylvania, not Temple, but he was friends with a crowd of people I knew. And he had produced The Elephant Man and Francis, which Mel Brooks produced. <laughs> and he had made a deal with David Putnam, who had produced Chariots of Fire, and was then the chairman of Columbia Pictures, to produce six short films by union-affiliated craftspeople who wanted to direct fiction films, you know. I had submitted a script which was not selected, so there was no nepotism there. But however, Jonathan called to ask if I would come to LA to be the post-production supervisor because he knew I could do all the jobs to finish a film. So I agreed to come out for a few weeks. I met the worldwide uh, head of post-production, Tom McCarthy Sr. at Columbia, who said, thank God, somebody who knows what the hell they're doing. Anyway, I love that. <laughs> And I read all six scripts, interviewed each of the six newbie directors as to how they envisioned any special effects they'd need and discussed their scripts with them. And I met with the great John Dykstra, talk about starstruck in more ways than one, who had already been the effects designer on Silent Running, you may have seen that, the first two Star Trek films. He designed all the special effects in those and nothing to do with this time, but he also was the uh, effects designer for several of the X-Men and for Spider-Man films. Uh, and his company, Apogee, was providing the effects for the project. Pretty exciting for me. 
And I also was very good at, at uh, special, at optical effects, uh, something I had learned how to do over the years pretty well. So I designed the post-production Bible for them, including for titles, mixing effects for the entire project that was going to go on for six months after our return to New York City. And the production manager, Steve Anderson, told me the following year that everything went exactly as I had designed and said it would. And he thanked me, as did Jonathan and the Columbia team. And one of the films, Ray's Male Heterosexual Dance Hall, uh, directed by Brian Gordon, which was a place men came to dance with each other who were straight after work so they could let their hair down. <laughs> it was very funny. It won the Academy Award in 1987 for Best Short Live Action. And my reel starts and ends with scenes from this film that happens to have an actor named Bob Wall in them. He had a TV show about being a sports manager on for quite a while. You might have seen that. So when I returned to New York in the fall of 1987, two things were clear. If I wanted to direct a feature, I needed to concentrate on just that. I had the connections. And second, Digital Post was taking over. At that time, one avid rig with the supporting equipment cost about $100,000. And if I purchased a rig, I would need to have all advertising clients to afford it. And as you can tell, I didn't just stick to my advertising clients. So I didn't want to do this, so I closed my shop. P.S., many colleagues that had production and edi editorial shops like mine who purchased that early round of equipment went out of business by 1995 because the newer avids had great improvements and the price came way down. It was the end of an era. And I went on to freelance, writing and directing various commercial projects, plus writing my own scripts and working on getting my features produced, as well as eventually becoming a, a publisher. But these stories <laughs> are for another time. And oh, about Mike Nichols. When I was on the board of New York Women in Film in 89 and 90, he was our guest speaker one evening. When I shook hands with him towards uh, at the end, I jokingly said, you know, this is not the first time we've met. So he looks and I say, when you accompanied Jules Pfeiffer to the opening of Crawling Arnold in Philadelphia 30 years ago, I was the usher who seated you. So he paused and looked at me carefully and I don't know if he was joking or not. He says, I remember you. <laughs> so that was cute. And these stories are a few of my personal treasures. I hope you enjoyed them. I have loved producing, directing, and writing, and editing so many great projects, and meeting and working with treasured professional colleagues. In every situation, being a grand master of my production fundamentals, mandatory, and having an understanding of how to find the spine of a story served me well. And in 2011, I was honored at Temple University with the Lou Klein uh, Distinguished Alumni Award at a lunch with several hundred people in attendance. And now, with all of my experience, I must admit I have not been editing on my PC computer. And I joined the video club so I could take Scott Marple's course and learn how to make movies on my iPhone. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think Wolfgang's going to roll the reel now for me. It's one for the money, two for the show. Well, my goodness, uh, I, I had no idea the spine of the story would have 
ten thousand names associated with, but uh, very. I thought about not you know? putting them in, but I really couldn't. I couldn't think just um, ambiguously telling the story. No, it was wonderful. I, th I think it was amazing uh, the path that you've taken to uh, create that spine. And to add to that, for tonight, something I'm sure you don't have, something you'll treasure, oh, your own Video okay. Club coffee mug. Thank you, so <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks again. That was wonderful. My pleasure. I'd be happy to take any questions if you have any. Are we on, on the mic now, Jim? Yes, no. Sort of, kind of. No. No, I I only knew people. I only really knew people that were directly involved with any of the mobile shows. Yeah, I didn't hang out over there. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay. All right. Thanks again. Thank Very you. Nice. My pleasure. All right. I will say one thing. We don't have children. <laughs> we have 15 first cousins once removed, but I don't, I think it was, it was hard enough for me, but it, if you have children, it's easier now if you have children. There's so many women in production, but it was at that time when I was starting, it's, yeah. we didn't plan it that way, so but that's what happened. They were your children. Take care of us and all day. Yeah. <laughs>